Good morning, everyone. This last week, I had the great good fortune to accompany 29 other people on a spiritual pilgrimage down to the uh, Encinitas and Los Angeles area where we visited all of the places where Paramahansa Yogananda um, wound up living and doing a lot of his teaching uh, while he was in the United States. At first, of course, he traveled all over the country, but ultimately pretty much settled down there and had people come more to him, both in the Encinitas Hermitage and then in various places in the Los, Los Angeles area. It was, uh, as spiritual pilgrimage is meant to be, and often is, a really rather extraordinary uh, four days. Um, as much as anything, just because, uh, as Yogananda himself has said, first he told us, I meditated on every square inch of Mount Washington, and uh, also has said that that's true of the land at the Encinitas Hermitage, but also sharing with us in many ways in his writing the fact that once a master's energy has been put out literally into the ether. It's there forever. So when you're in these holy places, you become so aware of their presence. It's not as if they were there at some time. That's not the feeling that you have when you're there. You feel like you are right with them. And for any of you who have been to any spiritual pilgrimage site, uh, around the world, I'm sure you know what I mean. But like so many things on the spiritual path, it's just something that one needs to experience and then one knows the truth of that. So this outward spiritual pilgrimage, of course, is meant to uh, allow us an easier way to manifest, to touch into what the whole purpose of this life is about. This life is a spiritual pilgrimage, and it's a pilgrimage that we're making up through our astral spine. It's a pilgrimage of the soul uh, that has become separated from that place of oneness with the divine, of a one universal consciousness, and is sort of out there roaming, if you will, and finding its way home. And we go out and we go on these spiritual pilgrimages to remind ourselves how to keep stepping back on the path, stepping back on the path, keeping God, the image of God, the words of God, the experience of God right in front of us. So we do that for a few days or a few weeks. Um, and there were many great moments, but when I came home, I realized that what I was coming home with beyond all of, all of the unique individual moments and times where I felt the most deeply connected to Yogananda and to some of the other saints that lived with him was a profound feeling for just how precious this life is. And it felt like that. It felt like this life, Shanti, right now that you're living Get in it. Do it now. Make as much spiritual progress as you possibly can because the masters just felt so real. It was just like Yogananda was there with his arms around me the whole time. How could I not? Just with so much love and devotion and such deep respect and attunement, do everything I could do right now here to make as much progress and spend as, as much time with him as I could. And I, I didn't know then that the topic today was reincarnation, but when I read it, I think on the bus, maybe I did, maybe on the plane on the way down or the, the bus on the way home, but I started thinking about the topic and how to talk about it and how hard this notion of reincarnation is for so many. Not that I want to try and 
approve the notion because that, of course, would be impossible for me. But I was asking myself, why does it feel so natural for some of us or uh, at times in our life it feels right, other times it feels like just a word or a concept and how do, we, how do we wrap our energy around it? And I started thinking about uh, how vast, uh, how, first of all, how vast the universe is. And in fact, last night I Googled um, how big is the universe? And so I got all these answers, most of which I did not understand at all because it tells you how big it is in light years. Oh, I don't know how big a light year is. I can't do anything bigger than this, you know, or this room or this town. What is a light year? And then it says it's billions of light years. And then it says, but you can't even count on that because the universe is always expanding. So it's always getting bigger, moment by moment. It just means nothing to me. I, I came across this uh, wonderful, I wish I had some way of sharing the website with you, though perhaps some of you have seen it. This wonderful, uh, talk about a picture being worth a thousand words. It says, here are 208 seconds that will blow your mind about how big the universe is. So I clicked on it. And it's really fascinating. It starts with, here's Earth. And Earth takes up the whole picture on the screen. And it says, big, right? And you go, yeah. And then it starts, it goes very fast, picture by picture. Well, here's the Earth in our planetary system. Here's how many planets you could fit in. And guess what? Some of those planets are 350 times the size of Earth or more. And it just keeps expanding like that. And then it says, look at Earth compared to our sun. Scary, right? Yeah. <laughs> scary because the sun's hot and it could really hurt us. But then it says, look at the sun compared to other suns. Then it goes on into galaxies and it shows the earth in the Milky Way. You can't find the earth in the Milky Way. It's a t less than a millimeter dot and it goes on and on and on. It's beautiful. It's beautifully done, but you think, I can't think like that. And then we're taught, so we have this concept of samadhi, of becoming one with God, and of being able to live in all of those galaxies at all times, knowing everything about them. Of course we can't fathom that. Then we're told, not only could we do that, which is unfathomable, but it's going to take millions of lives. It takes 10 million of those lives probably just to get to the point of being a human being. And then guess what happens? We get to be a human being and we have free will so that we can delude ourselves a little bit. <laughs> and in the midst of that delusion, you know, the kind of, gee, power, that sounds good, but we don't necessarily go after divine power we go after power in the form of more money, in the form of controlling other people. Ah, joy. But we don't go after divine joy because we have free will. So we go after momentary pleasures and we think they're joy. We don't seek divine love. We seek relationships, something so minor compared to what's there for us. And so we get to put in another 10 million years. <laughs> and if we're lucky, we stay on the path and we keep going forward. We don't, in fact, lose ground in some of that. No, it's too, it's too big for us. There's no way in the world for us to be able to fathom this. Of course, the topic of reincarnation would be challenging for many people. Then I remembered a story that Swamiji told. It's a well-known story, but I heard Swamiji tell it about one of Tibet's greatest yog yogis, Milarepa. And the story is that he was born into a family of great means. 
they had money, they were highly respected, they lived well in a beautiful um, house, I'm sure it wasn't just the house, ate great food, and then his father died while he was still a young man. And so, as was the custom of the time, all of their belongings were given to an uncle. And that uncle and his wife, the aunt, wound up over a period of time cheating Milarepa and his, his, his whole family. They stole all their money. They had them living in shacks. They had no clothes. They had no food. So Milarepa's mother was getting more and more and more angry. Understandable, right? Everything was stolen from her. She was betrayed by people who supposedly loved her. So she says to Milarepa, who's a small boy who loves his mother, I want you to get back at them. I want you to learn black magic, and I want you to harm them. So he does. He goes out, and he, they find him a teacher, and he learns black magic. And in a series of events, he winds up killing much of the family and injuring and harming many, many others. And his mother is overjoyed with this. She feels that she's gotten back what she deserves. But it comes to Milarepa that he has just made many huge mistakes. And he feels an enormous sadness about it. And he realizes that he himself will have to suffer because of those mistakes that he made. And he realizes many things in there that come to him that are relevant for us right now and in this topic. He realizes just how fragile all of our decision-making faculties are when they're wrapped up in ego. He realizes how insecure life is. He realizes that the possibility for the possibilities for delusion are infinite. And he realizes how many mistakes one could make, not even being aware that we're making mistakes, even when our intentions are the best, that we could go out. Here he was, obeying his mother, acting out of love for, for his mother, seemingly taking back what was theirs. And yet he realized the enormous suffering that was in that and how unconscious all of that is. How easy it is to live so unconsciously even as we're making great effort. And he, it came to him that while he had this great incentive to do what was right, while he had not just the opportunity, but the will and the willingness that he was going to learn how to live well, he wanted to become, and he set this as his goal, which he attained in that lifetime, an enlightened being. I thought to myself, that's so interesting. That's what I was feeling when I was in Encinitas. That's what I was feeling when I was in Mount Washington and at Lake Shrine and all of these places where Master was. It was as if I, and I would say we, because I felt it in many others, we could hear the call of the Master saying, stay with me. I will show you the way. Decide to do it right now. We have no idea what our karma is. We can't hardly remember last night. I've asked people in my medical practice when they tell me they eat well, what did you have for dinner last night? They don't remember, or they're not willing to tell me. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's really hard. Try and think of everything you did this week. We cannot remember our karmas, but we feel our inclinations. And so we are inclined to keep repeating past bad habits or to be drawn in certain 
directions to like certain people, not like others, to be good in moments, but also to carry negativity, to be attached to a lot of things in the world, to needing fine food, big homes, more relationships, on and on. We don't know why. We can't remember why. We cannot solve this problem of our delusion by ourselves because the ego has such a hold on us. We can't do it that way. But that's why we can't think of reincarnation. We can't make it logical. It's entirely too big for us. But we have this moment. We know, like Milarepa said, that we can do this right here, right now. We can begin to love God, to turn our attention towards the divine. You know, there's a person in our congregation who very often comes to our purification uh, ceremony. And some of you, I know, haven't been here, but you come up and you come before one of the light bearers who are really serving as channels for these masters in the moment. And you say the words, I seek purification by the grace of God. It's so beautiful. And everybody comes up and it's so dear. I never hear those words that I'm not deeply touched by it. But this person comes up and says, I seek purification by the grace of God right here, right now. <laughs> That's what she says. And every time I'm blessed, by her coming and kneeling in front of me, I can't help but I say to myself, Master must be loving that. <laughs> because that's the energy and the spirit that he loved in, in the effort to move towards God. So, how can we do this? We can do this both inwardly. We've talked about this many times. This we do by meditation by trying to move to that place of formlessness, of egolessness, of non-attachment, of realizing that Maya has played a great trick on us. And of course, Maya is great. Maya is a part of God too. Whatever he does, he does very well. We're living in a dream. We're watching a movie. It's so hard to remember this tiny little being where we can't even see the Milky Way on some of the Hubble telescopes. Do you understand? How are we going to remember we're not real? We're nothing. It's impossible. So we get involved in the dream, and we get involved in the movie, and we try and analyze it, and we try and argue with it, and we try and perfect it. We'll just move this piece here, we'll move that piece over there, We'll marry this person. We'll go for these goals. That's not what we're doing. This is what we can only learn in meditation. Our goal is not to perfect the dream. Our goal is self-realization, which means transcending the dream. That's what we want to be doing. And so we do it by giving ourselves over to meditation, to that one place that can take us beyond mind. That's how we transcend this reality that just looks so real to us. Just this little body, this little room, this little church looks so real. We meditate. And how do we do it outwardly? We do it by telling ourselves that we are going to practice seeing God in everyone and everything. We just start it as a practice just a little bit. Try it all day. You won't be able to hold on to it for very long initially, but eventually the experiences start coalescing. I once heard Ananta up at the village say that when he was uh, working at East West in Sacramento, he said, we played a game. The game was everyone who walks into this store is Babaji. And he said, now, Babaji's good. Many of us have heard many stories about Babaji. He doesn't walk up and say, Shanti, I'm here, I'm Babaji, get on your knees, fall in front of me. No, he, he hides himself from us. He wants to see, are we finding the divine in everyone? So as Ananta said, he's going to come in as all of our customers. They're going to be rude, they're going to be demanding. 
It's not going to be easy, but we're going to say to ourselves, that's Babaji. That, oh, look at how Babaji is dressed now. Look at Babaji trying to pickpocket, trying to take something out of his store. <laughs> we will see Babaji everywhere. We will hold ourselves as channels of divine energy, reminding ourselves constantly to be allowing God's infinite love, infinite joy, infinite wisdom to flow through us. We will do all of this every day as often as we can so that we remember who we really are. You know, we, I'm going to close with this. Uh, we have a lot on our agenda today after this, but I want to close with this, uh, just this little, not story, but we have a very dear friend, many people who, who are here today know, uh, Christy Norfleet, who has uh, an advanced stage of breast cancer. Um, she's, she's just doing beautifully with it. I, I wish I had time to tell stories about her, but given, given the true goal of this life, of this incarnation, to get there now, right here, right now. When we remember that, we look at Christy, who is just turning to God in every moment of her pain and her difficulty, so that as her body is struggling and you see it struggle, her eyes and her face are really filled with joy, even when she says at times, I'm, I'm afraid. Then, but you feel that as she feels some fear, she turns to God, or she's looking for God in each of us who go there. Boy, what a reminder to be as pure a channel as we can be. But she said two things to me last week when I was visiting her, one which was very funny, which I'll share with you, and then her bit of wisdom. This, this first one was in a text. She was writing to me about finding courage and what that meant. Um, just wrote a, a text to me, a long text about her experience. And then she said to me, many times in this life, I've been asked, make me free in this life. And then she does dot, dot, dot. And she says, I guess it's a little late to say, just kidding. <laughs> what a beautiful sense of humor, huh? So lovely. But when I was with her last week, Sita and I were there. She looked at us at one point, um, and she said, having lost a lot to this point, I mean a lot of weight, all of her beautiful hair, really almost the ability to get out of her, her bed at this point. And she looked at us, and she said this, as if we were hearing it and somebody was saying it to us for the first time. It was very powerful. She says, you know what? What's so interesting? She said, none of it matters. None of what goes on in this life matters. It was so clear in her that it absolutely, I don't know what experience Sita had, but in that moment, I got it. We, we come in with nothing we leave with nothing other than our connection to the divine. That is the only thing we take with us. We have this blessed incarnation, this extraordinary opportunity to travel as little as we want or as far as we want. This is why we can look at the notion of reincarnation as we let go of one attachment after another because all of what we think is so important right now, no matter what it is that you're thinking is so important other than God, you don't take any of it with you. None of it matters. As Swamiji has said over and over, he says, look at this, millions of lifetimes, millions and millions of lifetimes. And at the end of it all, what a cosmic joke, the sum total has to be zero. You have to come right back here to that place where you know God's love. So when they say what will be asked was how much did you love?
that's the truth. Open your hearts. See God in everyone. Be a perfect channel. That's our goal for this life.